episode 192 of the Radio Impound Podcast. 192. We're, we're, uh, <laughs> we're getting close. It only took seven years, but we're finally here. I mean, I mean, we're going to close it in on a decade. Hopefully by then we're on episode like, uh, 201. <laughs> 201. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What's new, Jason? I, I saw you at this freaking uh, monster truck stuff going on at the Monster Jam. They were just up here at my end of town, and now they're down in Orlando, Florida. Yeah, this is the first uh, first world finals I've ever held in Orlando. Uh, for the pre- previous 19 years, it was in Las Vegas. Oh, so Vegas gets for world, world Finals twenty, they brought it to Orlando. Wow! And they signed they signed on to do it there, um, two thousand nineteen and two thousand twenty. Does uh, Disney uh, does Disney uh, have their hand in that? Feld Entertainment. Feld Entertainment. That's who owns. That's who owns Monster Jam. And uh, uh, they're also. The world leader in producing and presenting live touring family entertainment experiences that bring people together. So there you go. So they used to subsidiaries. Uh, they used to run the circus, Ringling Ringling Brothers and Barnum and Bailey Circus. What? Uh, that's who uh, used to own this. And you know the circus isn't around anymore, right? Um, no, I thought I saw somebody, uh, one of our Facebook friends was just at a circus recently. It probably wasn't a Feld one then. No, it must have been just like a knockoff, I guess. No, because when you go to these circuses, there's people out there protesting all the time, right? Yeah, I mean, remember when I went to, and did that and, well, here's their, uh, here's actually what they own here. Um, Who, Feld? Monster Jam. Monster Jam, yeah. okay, yep. Monster Jam, Monster Energy Supercross. Okay. And then Disney Disney on Ice, Disney Live, Marvel Universe Live, Sesame Street Live, Trolls the Experience, and Jurassic World Live Tour. Wow. Good Lord. So, yeah, I mean, so you can see, you can look down the list of the things that they're involved in, and it's very kid-oriented. Yeah, they're laughing all the way to the bank. Yeah. For sure. So... You know, that's the tough part about this, the monster truck side of things is when I was a kid, I talk about this all the time when I go to the events, but when I was a kid, uh, this was an adult thing. Um, You know, in Florida, especially, it was the time where, you know, the guys would bring the trucks out straight out of the mud bog and they're parking in the, you know, the, you know, the parking lot and tailgating and, um, getting into the stadium and it was, they had the, the outlaw country music playing and there would be, you know, guys would be fighting in the crowd over Ford and Chevrolet. And, um, it was, you know, people would bring their kids back then, but it wasn't really made for kids. It was made for adults. And over the years, you know, have they have established these kind of things as, you know, they're money makers because of kids. And you know they go in, they buy the toys, and they see these trucks that are, you know, made. They make them like Scooby Doo, and I mean they have a lot of huge sponsors. So it's important for them for it to be very kid friendly, and because that's who they're selling to. Yeah. So you know when I was going when I was a kid, it was the opposite. It was like it was like the outlaws were out there. And, uh, you know, it was you know, ugly truck contests, you know, girls dressed to the nines mm. um, in their outfits. And uh, it was just, you know, mud bogging, you know, truck pulls. And, you know, it was it was rednecky. Uh, but. Um, but this now <clears throat> is to try to make it very fan or family friendly and yeah you know i think if it's gonna if it's gonna exist over a period of time you know that's probably the direction it has to be um in the political correct 
era that mm. we're in. Um, you know, it's funny, you know, they're also sensitive about the names of the trucks. You know, it's, there used to be a truck called uh, Gunslinger. They made him go to Slinger because they didn't want to have a gun in it. But, you know, your most popular truck is Gravedigger. You know what I mean? It's like, yeah. <laughs> and then Maximum Destruction. Those are your two most popular uh, names. But I think it's a 60,000. If it's max capacity, it's 60,000. And the first night, which is racing and two-wheel skills competition, mm. I'd say there's about 30,000 people there. Wow. But on on Saturday it was it looked to be a sellout. So, uh, you know, so either way, between the two days, they got about ninety thousand people. Uh, not bad. Damn. Pretty good. Not bad. So, uh, yeah, they call this their world finals. So, I kind of struggle with that name a little oh, because yeah. I don't, I don't really understand like. You know, like we're, you know, in a competitive environment, you're always looking for the NBA finals, the Super Bowl. And it's the and it's, it's the combination of a uh, like a year's worth of competition that ends at one event. But in this, like anybody can win the world finals uh, at the final event. Like it's not like. You know what I'm saying? Like it's not a point series that I know of. Yeah. Um, so, so it's a, it's more like just having a, a big event and yeah. calling it the World Finals. Yeah, there's no build up to it or nothing really. Yeah, I mean they have a lot of events at the first quarter of the year that build towards it, but it's not like. But it's not a point series me, or nothing. Yeah, like to me in in our uh, what I would be used to would be all these events you'd have points and then going into this last event would be where you could win the whole thing. Right. Right. Um, so I don't think that they do that, which I think would be kind of neat, but, um, and maybe the reason they don't is cause they have, they don't stop having events. Like after that, they will be, you know, going all year. So it's like their calendar, the way it works or something. But anyway, it was a success. It's entertainment. It, it, you know, there's there's racing, a part of it, but it's very entertainment based, and it's for kids. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for the last four years or five years now, um, one of the drivers, Bari Masauer, uh, he drives the zombie truck. Um, he's been an RC guy for a long time, and he's actually um, organized to have an RC portion. Uh, to the world finals. So that's where this RC world finals came from. Oh, okay. Is um, he organized this event and then he kind of got, uh, I don't remember what the number is, but it's like six or seven of very close friends of his to help uh, put the event together, the RC version, and uh, invite some racers in to compete and it's part of the show. So when a fan pays at the world finals to come in and see um, the actual event itself, you first go to the pit party. And during the pit party, you can actually watch the RC race because the way they've scheduled it, uh, the fans know when the RC race is going to happen. Oh. So, so um, they run a program every day, or both uh, Friday and Saturday on the RC side, where um, you can just come in, you can watch qualifying, and then you can walk up and there'll be racing going on, and then there's freestyle, and then we did some speedster stuff, which they call it speedster, we call it UTV. But, mm -hmm. um, so we do all that uh, during Friday, then... Uh, we turn it around and we do it all again on Saturday. And uh, this is my first time being involved. Uh, Fred's done it every year. And it's actually been really cool. It's worked out pretty well. So it was nine people, 
nine people involved uh, kind of putting this on and help running it. It's a big deal because it's uh, the track is looks like a scaled down version of the real track. And so you got to have dirt, first of all, got to bring that in, lay it out and lay out the track, uh, paint everything up, assemble it. Uh, so it, it, it looks cool. Um, I think the, when we, you know, we're talking to the fans and stuff because they kind of surround it and they sit there and watch. And, you know, when you go and talk to the fans, I, I would kind of make it a point to say, uh, you know, hey, what have you seen today? What do, what are you liking out there? You know, I'm kind of, you know, asking the kids and the parents and, you know, the kids are just like, oh, this. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> They're like, this is my favorite. Yeah. <laughs> so, of course, you got kids that come into that are like, um, can I drive? I'm like, well, not really. Hmm. You didn't have nothing. They didn't have anything there set up for them to just run around and bash? No. Uh, there was a couple cars they did, but they really weren't for that. They were just for some kids that were. Let me try to see. Um, a couple kids there brought in their cars, but they were like um, kids of the parents that were like a part of the real event. Oh, okay. So, but they didn't actually have anything that the kids could play with RC wise. They did have, um, you know, like the uh, the Spin Master, you know, die cast toys. They had like two or three locations where you could kids could bring in like kind of like static type of toys mm -hmm. and play with them there, which actually, you know, you'd look over there and their kids would you know, uh, be working on it. So, so it was good. Yeah. Really hot. It's Florida. It looks, it's almost like it just started like coming into summer. Yeah. It was like, 90s oh yeah it was 91 92 it, degrees very humid right oh it was humid yeah the, the guys from california were yeah. see i'm coming down there in july for a week and uh was... you're gonna know what it's really like then <laughs> oh boy all right I'm thinking maybe i should have scheduled that a different uh different date but what the heck Last time you're down here, you're at the beach the whole time, so that would probably be nice. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's not long. I mean, when when were you down here before? Was it like March? Uh, I was down there in uh, April. Okay. Yep. What's your actual uh, when in July are you coming? Uh, I'll be down that way uh, July seventeenth through the twenty fifth. Okay. Mark it on your calendars, wow. Jason. Put it in your iPhone. I, I, I think I will be here, actually. Dinner. Jason will be buying me dinner. <laughs> Get you some Wendy's. <laughs> uh. So, yeah, we, we did the racing. Um, then mm -hmm. we did the speedsters. Then we did the freestyle. So the event, I think, turned out pretty well. Uh, I ended up winning... <laughs> racing on both days and i won the uh, monster truck race and the speedster race now and, uh, were you going up against guys that uh, are in rc or were you going up a bunch of little 10 year olds no no no. these were all experienced guys okay and girls just, just making sure <laughs> yeah you know it's it's funny because people uh you know people think that that this is easy. Um, and I think before I did it, I kind of thought that it would be easy also. Yeah. <clears throat> but the reality is, is it's not. Um, because like I was telling somebody like Spencer, I was telling him when we were at Silver State, I was like, you know, I go think if you had a race with your Truggy where it was only three turns, I'm like, how close do you think it would be if you guys only raced three turns? You know, because these races are only seven seconds long. Hmm. So it's, uh, and the trucks don't handle that great. Yeah, they don't look, so they look like they're bouncing everywhere. 
Yeah, and they bounce all over the place. So you have to manage all that stuff uh, while you're racing. And you only have a seven second shot at it. So it's like, <clears throat> you know, can you, you know, there's no room for little errors or whatever and make up for it, it's over. So in general, it, it is a little nerve wracking mm. because the way the, the way the thing works is when you, if you have a large bracket of trucks, which is 24, mm -hmm. whatever, 32 trucks uh, at this event, at first, when you run your first race, there's a little bit of space between your next race. Say you win a race. Okay. Well, if you, if you lose, you're out. So you can't lose at all. Or there's no, Okay, so yeah, once you, you can't, yeah, once you're once you get beat, you're you're done. You, the other guy moves on to the next race. Wow. So, uh, oh, no loser so, bracket. Yeah, and this there wasn't a loser bracket. Sometimes if there's a an odd amount of tr trucks, they'll have like a fast loser, or they'll have something like that. But um, in this situation, there was. So if you lose, you're just out, hmm. and. So, so you're always kind of concerned because the race is only seven seconds long and you know you can't lose uh, if you want to get all the way to the end. So, uh, you know, you start off, there's a little bit of space between if you win, you move on to the next round. And then, you know, there's, and but as you eliminate people, you know, you go from 24 to 12, 12 to six, six you know, whatever the number is. Um, Every time you, you know, you, you move on, there's less time between when you race. So, because, you know, you're eliminating half the people each time. Mm -hmm. So, when you start getting right down to it, you're like, there's not really any time to do anything. So, your truck's just sitting there. I just left my truck turned on at the end, and... I would, they had a little position where you would turn Marshall at the end, so you would race, and then you would go to the end of the track, and you would help turn Marshall in case anybody crashed in the next race, and then you would kind of move on. So I would just keep my truck turned on, and it's like, you're, you know, you, you don't really have too much time to think about it. You, you kind of look at the track and make a couple mental adjustments, but it's kind of tough to do anything to the vehicle. So... And then as you start getting closer to the final, it, it gets a little more nerve wracking because now you're like, okay, like the pressure stuff starts mounting because you're like, all right, well, now I've made it this far. Um, now, you know, I want to make it all the way. Right. So, yeah, we did that and uh, did the final. And, you know, they, they run the music and before they start the final, they have a little a little music they play and they give you, you know, each driver gets an announcement and then you're you're doing it in front of a little bit of a crowd. So it makes it pretty cool. Yeah, then we did the Speedster race, which is a we use slash four by fours with a UTV body and short course tires. They looked cool. They were really fun to drive. Sounds good. I think uh there we got a video up about the event. I don't know if you watched that one yet or not. I watched you run around a few times. But that's up on Facebook in the uh, J Concepts garage, right? What we have now is we got a we got a full video on YouTube. No. Yeah. I'll pull it up and then I'll send it to you. All right. Could you hear that? No. Hmm, okay, so it, was, it only comes through my earpiece. So yeah, I just sent you the blog. Uh -huh. And I'll send you the video. Okay. See it. So, yeah, we just uploaded the video last night. And the blog was updated today. So that event is officially over for us as we were able to get all of our media-related content done. Here at the Monster Jam World Finals RC then we went into the big event, the, big, the, the real event. Everything was pretty fun there. So... You'll see a little bit of uh, you guys read the blog, you get the gist of the whole event, who won, the winners and losers. Yeah, I'm yeah, checking out. 
Oh, wow. And that ramp going down looked pretty big. It is, yeah. I mean, that was meant to... They made that because that was how the real track was inside the building. Oh, that's right. I did watch that. The um, That happened before the... That happened on Friday, I think, before the event. They did some kind of uh, showdown or something off, the, off that ramp. Oh, there you go. Yeah, there yeah. you go. I see that. Well, who's running this event then? The RC one? Yeah. Well, there was like, um, there was about nine people involved and um, they all get together, whether, you know, they all have one uh, couple of responsibilities, whether it's to build the track or to do the announcing or scoring. Oh, here we go. We've got an interview with you here somewhere. Orlando, Florida, first time ever Monster Jam World Finals 20. And it's crazy out here, man. All right, here's Fred Reap interviewing uh, Jason Rona. That's right. We did the RC racing program this morning. My main man, Jason, taking home the trophies here today in racing. And the YouTube look at you, man. You look all cool over there, man. Look at you. Here in Monster Jam. But uh, how did Grave Digger feel today? It looked awesome. Yeah, I mean, uh, you got this thing detailed out with the Grave Digger uh, body here, the grandma team from years ago. And, uh, yeah, we're really happy with the way this thing was working. Oh, was that an older scheme there that you're uh, running? Yeah, Grandma Grave Digger is what they call it. Oh, Grandma Grave Digger. Okay. Mm -hmm. I didn't know they had one. That's cool. So I'm not up on all yeah, this. Yeah, they call the original Grave Digger Grandma. Okay. So that's kind of... Well, there's the zombie. Yeah, so you watch, this, you watch this video, you get kind of a, an idea of how the event is and what the, the, the atmosphere is like in... For the real event, and so you get a good idea of what's right going on. Yeah. Entirely ourselves, right here at home. Monster Jam World Finals here for the first time. Monster Energy Camp right here. Give you guys a little bit of a tour of our trailers. Our mechanics are shopping wow. our trucks right now. If you guys want to check out our our home away from home? We'll show you the ins and outs of our trailers. Come on in. We'll show you what we got. Wow, this is Jay Concepts going in the trailer here, huh? Yep. Here we are. This is our office. This is a this is a 53 foot. Kentucky moving trailer basically. We get them from Kentucky completely bare. The only thing wow. we do is the wooden floors. We outfit this thing entirely ourselves. We build a lit we install a list of cabinets, we build a ramp. Yeah, that's pretty cool, man. Oh the, look at this, they have a bump the box in this. Oh my yeah, god, Kirby. Uh, I, I thought of, I thought of Kirby right there. Obviously tires go wow. up. Wow. Bump up box. Up Kirby. But how everything gets You'll have to check this out. That's at uh, minute mark uh, nine thirty. Interesting. Awesome. Yeah, we'll post a link on the uh, Facebook. That's pretty cool, man. The Facebook. So I wonder so, if uh, Bump Box was involved with the uh, Monster Jam there. I haven't seen um, if he does any other. That's pretty cool. Kirby just got a Bump Box. Solution. Yeah, it looks, sounds like he's, I mean, he loves that thing. Yeah, they're awesome. The, the you know I mean, and and the true. Patriots had one after they won the Super Bowl in the locker room. They had a bump box, so uh, go check it out. Uh, bumpbox. Uh, okay. com. Yeah. This is like the new Beats by Dre, probably. Uh, you know, it's a it's a boom box for you listeners. It's a big boom box. You can get different sizes, and uh, yeah, it's really cool. It's all Bluetooth, and uh, it's really awesome. And uh, yeah, of course, Patriots were using it, so uh, that makes it awesome, right so there. That's cool. Yeah, it's cool. So it's cool. So it was in the Monster Energy trailer. Awesome. Cool. Yeah. <clears throat> well, it looks is like it a called, good time called, here. I'm scanning through the video. Is it called Bump Box? Or... What is it called? Yeah, Bump Box. Okay. B-U-M-P. That spells bump. And then uh, Box, they get really tricky. with that. It's B-O-X-X. -X. See what they did there? So you can check them out. Go on uh, Instagram. Follow them there. Got a lot of celebrities promoting that thing now, so. Yeah, it's kind of what I was thinking that this is like the beats. They're trying to use that same marketing scheme as the beats we're yeah. using. Right. All right. Well, Monster Jam. That uh, looked really exciting. Yeah, I, I think people should check out the video for sure. You get an idea of what kind of the, the feel and the flair is out there, and, and um, kind of what it's like to be involved. And you know, it's all racing. Uh, at the end of the day, um, you know, whether you're 
10 scale off-road racing, 8 scale off-road racing, touring car, uh, monster trucks, drag racing. I mean, they're all races. So people are just as intense. They're not willing to give in to anybody. Um, so that's kind of what I'm enjoying right now is yeah. um, trying, trying some other things. Um, I, I want to get, I want to do some drag racing this year. Oh yeah. I'd like to I'd like to get out and try some drag racing. Okay. Um and uh, I'm going to try some doing some scale off-road stuff this year too. Oh. Uh, just to kind of increase kind of increase my uh, base and experience in the different classes. Uh you know, we make a lot of stuff for all these things, but I, I haven't <clears throat> um, necessarily ran a lot of it personally. So I, I want to try to get to a lot of those things this year and just kind of be involved to to be a little smarter about it this uh and you know what and you're talking about this, is this what associates doing now with the element well what or, they're or, doing is um we talked about it a couple times on the show but oh we did one of the biggest one well no no not not the element part oh but, okay um, i was like what one of the one of the biggest things in RC right now, the growing segment is scale off-road trucks. Okay. Uh, they they used to be called crawlers, and a lot of people still call them crawlers. But in in it, when you're in it, people like people uh, call it scale off-road or trail trucks. Hmm. So they people are into making these things as cool and realistic as possible. Yeah. Um, they want it to look like a real truck. Um, you know, people go, they, you know, they're into interiors and putting knobs. Yeah, I was gonna say they are. I mean, it's crazy. Yeah, putting <laughs> everything in it, and this is big. It's yeah, it's really big. It's a big market, and uh, it's probably the the thing that's uh, the most popular in RC at the moment, uh, and that's the reason why Associate is is getting into it with this new brand. Um, you can tell that they've. They're feeling that it's so important to be involved in some type of hobbyist product that they've made a new brand mm. just for it. So I, I I venture to say that you know they're going to have a few different vehicles along this this brand name, and as long as this scale push in RC continues to go. Um, I think you're going to see that brand continue to grow from Associated. And um, a lot of people are in it sooner uh, than them, um, which it's always hard to come from the outside in because uh, once you get established as the name in that business, it's hard to go in and replace the people that have been doing it since the beginning. So, you know, like the Axials and, Certain companies yeah. have, um, they've been the one, the ones known for being in that business, uh, the whole time. And, uh, then you got Traxxas in there now and it's going to be a tough market. Yeah. Um, but they got the name. So yeah, I mean, they have, what they have is the ability to design it well. Yep. And, and then if you can get in with the people and they take you seriously, in the market and you're passionate about it, you'll have success. Um, you know, a lot of vehicles on the market that are selling are kind of junk. They're not really that great. Uh, people get them and then they upgrade the mm. hell out of it. But in this, um, I think Associate is going to make a pretty nice vehicle under this new brand. And um, I mean, I think I'm looking forward to getting one. You know, I kind of want to do that. Like I said, I'm going to do some more of it this year and be more involved because I think it's important. Yeah, and you can help them out with, uh, you know, trying this stuff out, testing it. Yeah, I mean, I think they don't necessarily think that that is something that I can do or we can do. But, you know, mm -hmm. when, once we get a hold of it, um, I think they'll see that we can be successful as well. Yeah. So. Yeah, I like it. So it should be, it should be, it should be good. I mean, 
it is a natural, uh, there's a lot of natural fits for us in this business because a lot of people that work with us have a passion for, you know, real trucks and real cars. So um, if it comes to on-road or touring car, we got a lot of uh, passionate guys with a lot of experience there. If it comes to trucks and off-road, we got a lot of experience and passion there. And so I don't really see it as something um, that we'll have trouble being involved with because we've been involved with it since about 2008. We, we got into the crawler thing big back then. Um, and then the crawlers just died. It was like the fastest growing thing. Yeah. And then it just it blew past the hobby. It became this really ugly competition looking vehicle and it just killed it and then it went into scale trucks and when it went into scale trucks is when it really started growing hmm. the realism part uh, yeah. <clears throat> i watch these uh you know you know that i watch these on youtube the um from overseas they have this it seems like it's always from sweden but they have these um rigs and construction vehicles and so forth that look mm -hmm. so realistic it's unbelievable i i love watching that stuff they go through a construction site and they're doing stuff and it, everything looks so real it's amazing yeah i mean those guys it put is. so much detail into those things i can't imagine the money being spent but man it's so awesome just to sit there and watch it <clears throat> yeah and this is you know it's just we're just kind of reaching the peak of a lot of this stuff. And you're gonna see you're gonna see a lot a lot more to this. Mm -hmm. Shoot me over Kyle's number when you get a chance to Okay. Yep. I'll be right back. I can use the restroom. <laughs> so yeah, um we'll keep talking here while Gotti's uh, taking a pause for the cause, but we're going to have a special guest today, Kyle Layton. He was the stock champion at the J Concept Stock Nationals at OCRC Raceway. Uh, I believe last year we had Jake Thayer on the show because uh, he won he won one or two of the classes. I don't know, it could have been the year before that, actually, that we had Jake on. But... Uh, but again, this year, Kyle Layton won two-wheel and four-wheel. That was going on the same weekend as the Silver State event. So, But they still they had a 300-plus entry turnout there at OCRC. Uh, Kyle was uh, in top form. So just talking to him now, trying to schedule when to get him on. But he had, he had a great... Um, Great runs over there at OC, and kind of interested to hear from him a little bit. Give us a, a, a breakdown of how the how the race went, and you know what he was doing to, to get up to speed. Uh, right now, stock is probably the largest class in RC <laughs> racing, so I think uh, Kyle should be able to give us a, a nice update on how the stock industry is going. I just kind of gave a little preview into Kyle, um, what he won, and he'll be coming on the show. All right, when we come back from break, Kyle Layton will join us. Mm -hmm. Be right back, guys. Break time, Jason. Go get something to drink. Go to Starbucks quick. I got everything already. Oh, you already got yours? Yeah. Jeez. All right, well, I'm going to run downstairs then quick. I'll be right back. Hang in there, folks. Kyle Layton, up next on the J Concepts Hotline. Here is the world heavyweight champion. You know, I'll put girls, something on for you. Why don't you give board. it to him one more time? <laughs> Woo! That's who's standing here today. The world heavyweight champion. Only one. And you're looking. Oh, girls, I can't stand it. Now I got to talk. We all got to be quiet. Nikita Koloff, we've only just begun. That's the end of it. Dusty Rhodes, 
Don't ever make a mistake of sticking your nose in my business. If I'm down and out, I'll get up and take care of myself. So Dusty Rhodes, remember, when you walk out here, woo, talking Ric Flair, don't think you can walk in that ring and give me a hand or try to help me out and ease the tension in our relationship. Philadelphia, woo, I'm going to tear you down. Pensacola, Florida, when I get to town, we're going to treat all you women, woo, the way women ought to be treated. Because the NWA and some real men are going to take that Civic Center apart, and then we're all going to be over at Rodeo, woo, driving the women wild. Miami Beach, get ready. Woo, we are on tour, and we're doing it better than anybody else alive. Now, Buddy Landell, it's so hard for me to sit back here in this studio looking at a guy out here hollering my name when last year I spent more money on spilled liquor in bars from one side of this world to the other than you made. You talking to the Rolex. The Rolex wearing. Diamond ring wearing. Kiss wearing, stealing. Kiss stealing. Kiss stealing. Kiss stealing. Son of a gun. Son of a gun. A hard There's only one. Jim Crockett, when you brought me here 10 years ago, you knew that I was going to be the biggest star of them all. It cost a lot of money to bring the real world champion on location. Because, you see, when you got the Andersons, you know, we're family. Only in Arnie and Ricky. We do it better than everybody else. Don't wrap me up. The national tag team champions, the world tag team champions, Ric Flair, the world champion. All right. The world TV champion, the national wrestling line. Woo! Woo! Wow. That was intense, huh? I don't know if it's going to record me, but I did okay. Um repeating the um the rick flair you know uh sending out our thoughts to rick flair he was hospitalized today mm -hmm. so hopefully everything goes well there uh the reports i'm getting are that uh it's not as serious as originally reported okay so hopefully rick will be all right and um be back soon. Where's Kyle at? California. Okay. Kyle. Hey, what's going on? Gotti Jr. here. What's going on, man? Uh, just doing some wrenching right now, actually. Oh, nice. Nice. Uh, I gotta got stay on it. Yeah. I've been trying. <laughs> well, apparently you've been well, on it. Too. Jeez. Killing it at the stock nats. Yeah, it was a uh, fight the week for sure. Yeah, I was trying to give him a little preview before we got you on, but um, obviously you've won a lot of stock races in the past. Um, you also won that Roar Nationals back in Omaha. But uh, yeah. yeah, I thought it would be kind of cool to get you on the show, talk a little bit about that uh, the J Concept stock Nats you ran at OCE, and just a little about your racing in general. I mean, I, I was thinking a little bit today about how many you, you've ran just about everything now as far as raced you've been, uh, you've raced a lot of different scales and classes yeah i've done pretty much everything on road now too since the last 12 months and it's been it's been kind of cool you know you're doing everything and seeing all the different aspects how different everything is it's, it's way cool what uh where'd where'd you start and how did you get into it um i started i live in sacramento and i started with uh I went to the hobby shop one day and uh, one of the guys sold me a track to Slash and they like, yeah, there's a racetrack out there, Steve World Raceway. And I went out there and I kind of just like fell in love with it. And first time out in the track, it was super fun. And I'm always been competitive. So it just kind of suited me, I guess. And ever since then, I got Matthew 10 and then from there, the rest is history. You see that, Jason? Everybody's starting with Traxxas now. Like, but back in our day, it was Tamaya. Yeah. Isn't that exactly. interesting? Yeah. 
<laughs> when uh, this, Gotti's gonna love this because he he loves this guy. When did you meet uh, Matt Francis? Oh yeah. Um, I, <laughs> I haven't actually met him in person, but one of my friends grew up with him. Okay. And we just kind of talked over the phone. He gave me a lot of coaching when I first started, you know, because he was pretty pretty big, and uh, if not the biggest, and he kind of gave me some coaching on just how to if you want to make it a career or make make yourself known how to do it and I just kind of took what he said to heart and um just did my thing but I haven't actually met him in person like I've been keeping in touch lately with him I've been messaging messaging him a little bit and you know let him know what's going on and he just he's a cool guy I think <laughs> oh yeah, yeah definitely yeah he's I awesome mean, um I, I brought that up because I'm pretty sure that um Kyle's the only guy that I've ever that Matt Francis ever called me and said that we needed to get on board with was Kyle. Really? So <laughs> yeah, it's kind of interesting. But um, of all the phone calls you get, and then getting one from Matt who was for a recommendation for Kyle, which was kind of nice. Yeah, definitely. Um, Matt tried to help me out back in the day, just never worked. So. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, Gotti just couldn't implement it. Right? No, I, I could hear what he was saying. I just couldn't do it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. So so you got this uh, Traxxas Slash. You got an SC10. You got into racing. So how did it progress along? You, obviously, you bumped into a friend with Matt Francis, talked to him, got him on your side. and uh, but When did you start getting a little more serious about it? Well, I, I raced at the local track here. It was like, you know, Sea World Raceway. They're having a nap here this year for on-road. And uh, they did, like, off-road on the asphalt track. And yeah. so it was all a bunch of short course trucks, you know. And we had a fun time bash, and I met some cool people. And um, actually, I met some good friends there that I still talk to to this day. They come over and have dinner and stuff with us. And um, they were part of the B. Miller racing team. I actually remember that. The basketball yeah. player for the Sacramento Kings, Brad Miller. Yeah, he had a oh. racing team sponsored by Amy and Hobby. And I became a part of that. And so we go up to A-Main and A-Main Hobbies at Outback Raceway um, was my first dirt race. Mm -hmm. And after that, I was like totally hooked. I borrowed a buggy and I was like, man, this is awesome. And that's, that was like, man, this is like the coolest thing ever. And from there, I just started going to other local tracks and traveling around. And um, it just kind of progressed from there kind of oddly, I guess, because I didn't expect to, ever be this into it you know but here we are what what do you think um drew you to getting that tracks a slash that time was it kind of were they kind of urged by the hobby store or did the, the vehicle what what made you get that one well when i was like i mean i got that when i was like probably well 10 or 12 or 11 or 12 um and uh before that my dad had always I'd always had like, you know, Radio Shack RC cars and mm -hmm. Walmart RC cars and I wanted something better and I went there and asked them what was good and of course they said that was a good one and and then they said that they actually raced that stock slash class at Sea World, so that's where I was like, Oh, I can race it now too. So but then I had no idea like we had no <laughs> idea that that the R C the actual race vehicles were are what they are, you know what I mean? Like it's it's way different than a Traxxas car. Yeah. Right. But uh yeah, I mean that was just kind of the recommendation and we went with it and it wasn't I think maybe a few months after my dad bought me a full full blown factory team SC ten kit and all the goodies to go with it. So the the track you had at the time there you were racing at, they had a really they had a good short course class then. Yeah, they had actually they would get like literally a hundred like 60 to 100 tracks of slashes on a club night. Mm -hmm. It was only slashes. I mean, that's what it was. <laughs> yeah. And then we all we all figured out that we could run, you know, SD10s and the HPI Blitz back then. And um, I think Losi had a truck that was pretty good out there. And mm -hmm. I mean, everybody got those and the tracks of slashes were left in the dust. And we just, that's where it, then it kind of fell apart after that, I think. But um, it was it was fun for sure. And I, I can definitely blame the tracks of Slash for, for doing all this. <laughs> Get, getting you hooked. Yeah. 
so uh, so when did you get the a buggy for the first time where you actually bought one and kind of had to race it yourself yeah i was i went to that first dirt race and we met some people up there and uh well, i borrowed a buggy for the race for my friend terry wickham and we went up there and i raced it and i did pretty well um and then i bought a used d4 um first d4 used this for like 60 bucks and put some electronics in it and went for it and that's when i had my first buggy and i ran into an fc10 and had a b4 and that was my first uh my first race setup okay and then you uh how about four wheel when did you get into four wheel drive Jeez. I mean, four wheel. I got the. I had the B forty four point one, I believe. Can't remember. Okay. But, uh, yeah. I had that, and then I went on to the point three a little bit later on. I want to say the the point one, the original B forty four, and the point one. Man, I loved both of those cars. Uh, definitely. Yeah, those were battle pack cars, if I remember right. Yeah. I still have one of the chassis, actually. I found it the other day in my box. <laughs> yeah, I'm I really... Have a lot of stuff <clears throat> yeah, it probably depends on kind of what it is, but um, yeah, I, we got quite a bit of stuff here, too. I would only imagine. <laughs> I can only imagine. <laughs> So getting into the racing scene, uh, when did you feel that you, you know things were starting to get come together a little more, and you were getting faster to where you were being more competitive on a national or level? Um, I mean, the first couple years were actually like a blur almost. Like I can't really remember back to specific races or events, and I wish I could because I know those were some pretty fun times. And I really think though, I mean, I ran some. I mean, we had some races up in Outback. If you remember that track in Chico. Yeah. Uh, for like the J Concept races. And we had Outback shootouts, you know, and they were easily close to 400 entries. And I mean, that was a local track for me, but I think it brought a lot of talent. And that's when I kind of, when I saw, you know, like um, a lot of the pro guys show up and then they ran stock and I ran. I ran stock and I was making the mains and I was like, man, I could, I think I got a shot at this. And I kind of felt more comfortable there. My first like big travel race, I think was down to OCRC in 2014. For okay. SSJ concept stock nationals. Yeah. And I borrowed a B44. This is actually part of the start of my B4, my four wheel drive stuff was this, this, this race. So I borrowed a B44 and I didn't touch it all weekend. And I went out and drove it and ended up winning the A main. And that's when the four-wheel drive was 17.5, not 13.5, by the way. So it was a struggle. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> it was uh, that was my first like travel race, and I won, and I was pretty cool. And and I think it was after that that you know the I ended up getting on a couple different teams, and I think you guys included. Maybe it was before that. I can't remember, but um, I think that was that was the race that I was like, this is it, you know, this is my this is my thing. <laughs> kind of started feeling the flow huh yeah that was like my i mean racing at a at racing your home track your local track and people showing up i think is different than you and you travel somewhere to a place you've never been before and you end up doing well you know what i mean like it's a whole different more rewarding thing it because is you can have you know thousands of laps on the track and dirt and you go somewhere else and you have you've watched videos and seen pictures and that's it and you go compete and that's what I like. I mean, that's the, that's what I enjoy most is the traveling and meeting people and experiencing new racetracks and different events. It's just, I think it's really fun. So what do you see as, uh, you know, kind of going through the, uh, the success that you've had, uh, what, what races stand out the most for you that you've, you've done well? And I mean, you've raced a lot of, stock but then you know you've been running a lot of modified recently and uh and, and doing and doing well with it getting up there and, and racing with the guys that are um a little more on a, a pro level right yeah I, I, i've been running mods i mean i've been I've, after the roar nap in 2016 i kind of started to switch over if you remember um 
kind of I ran kind of both. Like I'd run mod at club racing and get some practice on big races. I'd run stock, but I mean, like this last year, like since we raced last year, I think I ran mod exclusively. I didn't touch a stock car until like three weeks before stock nats actually. Um, but I ran like uh, roar nats last year at hobby action, and that was a pretty tough race, but. I mean, I was pretty happy with my runs where I, I got a top 10 qualifying, you know, like I was, I had some pace and, um, some local races, you know, we have some fast guys around here and I've been pretty competitive for the front there every time. Um, but some of the races now at the most, I would say would be, um, surf city in, I can't remember the years, but I think 2017. It was the little mini surfboards, right? Yeah. So. Yeah. I have one on the wall actually. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. The one where I think you were there and Allison was there. I remember, mm -hmm. and uh, I did stock. I ran stock those both those years and won both those. And then this stock nationals this year was pretty big. I think <laughs> I wasn't. I was pretty surprised. But Roar Nats was big. Um, a couple of the Chico races were pretty big. You know, four years ago or so. Um, yeah, I mean, it's just weird to think. Uh, all the races I've been to and having pretty good success. How about this uh, recent stock nationals? Does that one stack up pretty well? Yeah, I think so. I mean, we, there's definitely some good competition there. And I mean, I can't say that I didn't have to work for it because I definitely did. I mean, there were some guys that, you know, we were all, all everyone was fast and within tenths of a second and qualifying and it was pretty crazy race to be driving in this stress and the you know the feeling you get when you're that close to the track and trying to gain time and you don't want to mess up and it was it was kind of more of a success for me and in, in my driving and my my performance in the weekend because I struggled toward the beginning and I kind of brought it back together at the end and I was pretty pretty proud of myself for that because that's pretty hard to do is to turn a weekend around like that you know what I mean like you start off bad and usually it's a kind of sets the tone for the whole weekend you know what i mean an uphill battle <laughs> yeah definitely i've had plenty of those <laughs> yeah which is okay that's, that's what makes you better yeah really does so as you uh you know as you kind of move along uh what do you think is you know some goals here as you, you know, kind of look to get a little better and you know do more winning like you're doing what what are some more of the goals yeah, I mean, I'd like to do get some better results at some of these races around mod. I know it's really tough to do, when you, especially when you have, you know, the the pro pro guys show up, you know, like the Spencers and Ryans and um, those guys. But I think I think with a little more um, time and you know just some more practice, um, I can definitely be up there because I don't I actually don't get to track that much when I'm not at a race. People don't know that but i don't i might get the track once every two weeks or maybe once a week that's about it mm -hmm. i'm pretty busy but i i want to try to work on getting there more and putting more time in because i i could tell like um example before we race this year i went to the track three times a week for a month and i could okay. tell a difference after the race you know what i mean i could just I could just, I made it a goal to do well at re race, and I made the main qualified six and almost made the main at four wheel. Um, and I just want to keep, I'm going to do that more, I think. Because it's definitely more rewarding when you do well than when you're in the B and the C main, you know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's no question about it. That's part of it. Yeah. Just practice is the big thing that I'm, I want to work on, I think. So with all the, you know, um, tell us a little bit about, you know, running all these different classes that you've ran and what it takes to kind of flip back and forth, you know, between the different ones. You know, you run some 10 scale electric, obviously you run some eight scale, you, you do electric eight scale, nitro eight scale, you've done some touring car. What, what does it take to kind of run these different classes and not really so much on a vehicle level, but what is it doing on a driving level? Oh, hold on. Still there? Yeah, I'm here. Still there? Yep. Jason, Hello? can you hear us, Jason? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm here. All right. Yeah, you didn't I'm drop here. off or anything. You're good. And Kyle's okay. here too. Okay. Yep. I am. Okay. 
my phone's been the problem one. Yeah, so I don't know if you heard what I was saying, but just, you know, what does it take to, you know, you're running all these different vehicles and stuff that, um, you know, what does it take to adjust and, and kind of get up to speed in these different classes? Yeah, it's uh, it's different. I mean, I, I ran some A skill the weekend before stock nap. I didn't run stock. I mean, I didn't run test skill until stock nap, and that was kind of a, a different deal driving wise for me because I thought like my cars were slow and I couldn't really. The feel was weird on them, but it's just kind of a thing you just get. I think you just get a feel for it after a while if you just keep switching back and forth or if you drive one for a long time, you kind of get stuck in a rut. I think so. I I try to kind of vary my driving. Um, even I, I don't run much four wheel club racing or stuff because you don't have much of a class for it. But when I run two wheel and I go run four wheel like re race or something, I can definitely tell a difference in the driving because you're kind of like timid and you got to just kind of when you go on the stand, you got to think this is what car I'm driving, this is how I have to drive it. And I don't know, it's kind of hard to explain, but it's definitely a learning curve. I will say that. What do you think you you know at this point? the stuff you've been running, um, what do you think is, is suiting you the best? What what do you think like feels more natural? Um, two wheel drive is my kind of my, my favorite. I don't know if that's because that's what I started with was all two wheel drive stuff or, you know, people say I drive really smooth and I don't push my four wheel drive cars hard enough, but I don't know. I can't really get past that for some reason. It's hard to, it's hard to do. People think it's easy just to change your driving style. Like, you know, overnight but it just doesn't, doesn't happen right i've been working on my full wheel driving and I, I went and ran some a skill a couple weeks ago and i've kind of worked on i just went and ran tank after tank after tank and just practiced my driving didn't even care about my car just wanted to drive you know i think that's what i don't know i think i think two wheel is definitely my favorite class dual drive buggy stock or mod but mod mod's fun gets a lot of power <laughs> yeah um, one thing you mentioned when you started that, uh, I was thinking about today was, uh, one of the videos you had shared and we're going to have to have, um, maybe you can <laughs> find it for us again to give to Gotti, but, um, of you driving on the outdoor asphalt track with your off-road, I think it was either truck or it was a buggy or a short course, but you said that you did that when you started early. But it looked like um, you kind of went back and did a little bit more of it later on. Uh, at the time, I remember seeing it and was like, you know, this kind of makes some sense to me because it was, it seemed kind of easy to set up in a parking lot. And I mean, now what we're doing on carpet and AstroTurf, it's not really like all that different. <laughs> um, no, it's from, not. So, um, yeah, explain a little bit how that, how came about and you know what that was like well i mean that's kind of where i started and we have a group of friends here and like my area that that's where <laughs> we all kind of met and so it's kind of like a i don't know what the word is like a old school thing for us or bringing back the memory so the track changed ownership when i post that you know and i went back to them and i said hey i want to start this program back up again and run some off-road on the track and i said yeah let's do it so my dad and I and some friends built some jumps and we went out there and we had, we had a pretty good turnouts for a while, you know, like 30, 40 entries maybe. Um, and it was just kind of a good like throwback kind of thing for, for my, my racing and our friends. And it's just, it's fun. And it's kind of funny because now that I go race on like a, a turf track, like you said, or a carpet track, it's kind of like almost the same exact thing. And it brings back the memories to me. I think that's why I like it so much. It's just uh, like, like a throwback it's, it's just it's just fun yeah I, I mean time. yeah i mean when i watch it i was like you know i i actually kind of like the look of this uh the video i saw i mean you were really hauling ass but um it was probably <laughs> a little like above what i would consider people starting at it of course but yeah. um but you could see it had those fundamental things in an easy setup uh the cool thing the cool thing about it, people that starting out, was that like, I mean, carpet and Astro, I mean, you have tires. I mean, it's, tires are easy to figure out, but you have tire wear sometimes. And it's uh, kind of like you have to have a car that's set up for like a high bite kind of thing. 
Um, but on the asphalt like that, I mean, I ran like my, my buggy right off the dirt, the clay track with some worn out slicks on it. And it was like, just as good as anything else. I mean, I tried different stuff and just kind of an easy way for people to start out and kind of get a feel for it. And, you know, it was clean. It was easy and it was fun. We had so many laps up on the stand and short course, just beating defenders and banging doors in. It was so much fun. You got a ton of practice probably doing that too. Yeah. And it was easy practice. I mean, and it just, that's like on road and off road. I mean, on an on road track, so layouts are kind of cool. Um, and just, you can just run, run, run. And just, yeah, like you said, just practice. That's, that's what you need. What do you, uh, from um, kind of jumping around, but you know, what do you see on coming up, coming down the road? You know, you start in short course, um, you know, you've, um, you know, got into buggy, you know, like we said, you've been in, running all these different classes, but when you're out and about, do you see anything that sticks out to you that maybe could be growing or, or could be uh, something of interest for people that, you know, kind of is that slash, you know, that kind of got you into it because we're, you know, from my perspective, what I'm seeing is we're missing that entrance entry level vehicle right now. Do you see anything out there that, uh, kind of gives us, you know, maybe something around the corner or something maybe that most people don't think about that is an interest kind of vehicle? Well, in the off-road stuff, honestly, I don't because, I mean, it's just so competitive. And as soon as as soon as soon you make a class for like a, a spec class, you know, you have the guys that are going to jump in it and they're going to, not. I wouldn't say ruin it, but they're going to, they're going to push a limit and it kind of, People don't want to put that kind of work in. I mean, they want to go to the track with their family and have some fun. And I really think I've been going up to a local oval track recently and checking it out. And I think the oval scene is blowing up because it's just a simple, um, I think it's a simple, fun way for people to race. I think it's, there's no jumps to worry about. Anyone can drive an oval car, I think. I mean, it's just, there's not, you know, a bunch of left and rights and up and downs and bumpy tracks, you know. I think the oval is going to take off for that reason. And I, I've seen it here, you know, like Chico has an oval track now, um, a couple of local oval tracks. And I think, I think that's going to be like the new, um, what's the word, the new like entry level thing, like you said, yeah, you know, entrance to RC. <clears throat> yeah. It's even if you're me in a way, because it's just, it's some good racing. It's like real oval racing. It's just good racing. Yeah. It's, it's, um, uh, it's something that you can get into and it, it has a seems like you can get on and get in it on a low uh, I don't want to say low cost point but a low skill point um, yes and I think they have I mean they have classes that are you know like a stock slash class there you know another example of a slash and they have slash over a they seen and um, people can go bring their car that they bought from the from the hobby store and go ran, run it. I mean, you can do it in off road, but the off road tracks, you know, as well as me, is that they're not as fun to drive when they don't work well. You know. Yeah. Mhm. Mm people want that. They want their car to look like the pros are on the track, and it's not going to happen until they either get practice and spend some money, which people don't want to commit to that all the time. Yeah. Yeah, that's. I think that's great information. So, um, you know, kind of on your path, you know, you're um, obviously getting better. Uh, like we mentioned, the results and, and kind of climbing the ladder there. What do you think is? Uh, we don't want to ask. We don't ask people this that often. Maybe I just thought of it to ask you. But why? Why are these guys like the the Mayfields and Cavalieri's, and why are these guys? so good and um what do you think the difference is for people trying to climb the ladder to get to that point what do you what do you think people are missing or in their preparation or techniques or uh you know what what is it going to take for somebody to get to that level and you know what do you see because you're competed against them with them um and you're kind of trying to climb that ladder but what do you see is going on uh, from that side of things. 
Well, the those guys, I mean, obviously people always say that they get paid and that's their job and yada, 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 and that's true. But I think, uh, I mean, I know that we're all humans and we're all capable of doing the same thing if we want to do it right. So um, from what I see, it's, and from my experience, most of this whole thing, if you have the speed on the track to do it, I mean, if you have lap times that are close to them, then you're obviously showing that you're on pace and you have the capability to do it. And it's all just mental from there on on, I think, because how many times you see somebody that's like in nationals or something when those guys on the track and they have, they're, they're competing with, you know, the people like me or somebody else and run good run. And, um, when the person crashes, well, I mean, if they have the speed, but they just mentally, they're not ready yet. And I think that's what people need to work on is focusing on their mental, uh, I can't think of the word, like their mental confidence or maturity and just focus on not letting anything get to them. I mean, people have a little mistake or they crash or whatever and they get all bent out of shape. And I think that's, that's, I mean, those guys are like Mayfield is just so spot on with everything. If you watch them drive, you get the same mark, the same thing. It's like a machine and it's like, Anyone can do that as long as they can they believe they can do it. Yeah. And that's kind of what I've been working on, just mentally like getting in the zone and doing your thing up there on the stand. Yeah, I think um, I'm trying to remember. I watched you run a very, you know, you've always I've always seen you run a lot of good stock runs, and but then when you make that climb to modified, um, I've seen you make some good ones recently. Um, I can't remember if you were at the Desert Classic that I'm thinking about or the Roar Nationals when it was at Hobby Action, but I remember you having some really good runs there, and that track is really hard. Yeah, I was in that Desert Classic this year, but I was there last year. I was at every race there in 2018 for Desert Classic, JC, and then the uh, Roar Nats. Mm -hmm. but, yeah, I remember you putting in some good yeah. runs. And yeah, I had and, a couple of good ones. Just couldn't put them in the same <laughs> in the same class, the same time before it kept the count, you know. But that's what, what I mean. It's, it's all consistency. What's your take on on that on uh, on racing on a track like that where you're running slicks uh, and the dirt's a little different than some of the others? And um, what, what do you think it, it's like, um, you know, trying to compete on on a, on a track like that? I think that's one of the tough that that surface and those that are like it are probably the toughest ones to race on. Um, not to drive on, but to race on because when you're racing, you're in a whole different mindset and you want to push your car so hard to be fast and everybody's pushing their cars to be fast and you have to kind of hang on to that thing for for the, for the whole race and you got to be perfect to win and that's what it is because if one guy's perfect, everybody's got to be perfect. Um, anybody that knows me knows I hate flicks and, uh, <laughs> but I mean, I don't mind tracks like that. that are kind of like a dry slick, the wet slick I could do without, but I'll race on it, you know, I'll race mm -hmm. anything, but I don't prefer it. But yeah, the, those tracks, the dry slicks, you know, you have, there's a groove and you have a dust group, dust line and, you know, tires are important. Compounds are important now. Um, <laughs> It's just getting so complicated that it's like it's tough to do, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people bring up these days, uh, and obviously you're uh, a little bit in, in this uh, side of it because you, you, do you still, uh, you guys still promote and use some of the the cheater racing products, right? Yeah. Talk a little bit about that, the tire sauce stuff and kind of how you got into that and how that's kind of affecting um, where that place is, is right now in off-road racing. Tire sauce as a whole? Yeah, I think, you know, kind of how you got into having some products, you know, with the, you know, the tire traction involved and then where that fits oh, in yeah. today. Um, well, it kind of happened because we hated, I mean, just the tire sauces when we started were, I mean, smelly and you know you get headaches and I mean I guess it still happens with some stuff but my dad came up with this stuff that it worked really well and there wasn't 
we used to we used to go to Chico a lot, and it was like a enclosed rooms for pitting. Remember before they remodeled? Yeah, there? very tight and, in uh, there. It was, yeah, and it was like that's where we kind of got the idea because it was like really bad. I mean, the buggy rip stuff and the Paragon, and it was like you'd walk in and walk out with a headache. So we designed the stuff to um, that wouldn't do that, and it worked well. And I've been using it. I mean, poof, probably for a long time now. <laughs> I can't remember, but. Man, I mean, I use it at every track I go to, unless there's a spec sauce, but it's great stuff. And I think the saucing thing, I mean, I think it's important, but I think sometimes it gets a little bit out of hand. Um, you know, I don't know. The tire, the whole tire prep thing nowadays, I think, is getting out of hand. I mean, it's too, I don't know. I know you know a lot about it, and I'm not a big fan of it, but you got to do it to be on, be on pace. But the saucing thing, I think, needs to be, kind of addressed and maybe a little bit more uh what am I looking for in the word uh, I know what you mean a little more <laughs> yeah yeah like it we need it like it definitely helps to do it but sometimes it's like people go a little bit overboard with it I think and it just kind of ruins it for everybody mm -hmm. um, I don't know if there could there's no way the problem is the people tracks have tried to police it and, and you know, control it, but people always find a way around it, and that's the problem. So then it's kind of like, well, we might as well let it go the way it was, and it ends up back where we started from. But I, I don't know. There was no tire sauce back in the day, was there? Like years ago. The first time I remember using tire sauce was around 1996. <laughs> um, well, then that's the year I was born. <laughs> oh, yeah, man. So, um. I feel old. That's the first time I remember using tire traction. Um, I remember guys saying back as far as 94. Or no, wait. Yeah, but Chris Bing. I think, 90, Chris I Bing, think actually 95 nuts. was the... 95, I think, was the first time I remember using tire traction. 94 is when I remember people hearing or remember hearing about the possibility of people doing it, but I don't think I ever did use any then, but for 95 is when it kind of started happening. Then I want to say 96 associated started selling a product called traction action that we were using. <laughs> and oh, man. Yeah, and then uh, Trinity got into it big time with Kinwald because then once Kinwald got into tire traction, it just it, it was it, it was such a big thing. And uh, but yeah, I mean we've been doing it uh, since that time. And you think it's, it's gotten worse? What's gotten worse, I think, is the pre and post prep of saucing it used to be we would mount a new set of tires then we would sauce them go run come back sauce again and run and that was really it that was really the only um part to it where guys are doing now where they break in the tires on like a drill then you sauce them and then either burn burn them in or <laughs> or or heat them that's um, the most fun part yeah, and to me, um, that's what's gotten. Uh, that's been what's been different is the the before and after prepping of yeah, of the tire. Like. And I think that's the part. It, the first step we could eliminate are those two. If we could eliminate the the front side of any kind of um, heating or burning in, and then the burning in before you race. Um, and, and when I say burn it in, it's not like you're setting it on fire, but guys speed the tires up on the drill and then apply the tire sauce to a rag. And then, so the tire gets warm while you're saucing it. Right. Yeah. I've done and, that once or twice. I'm guilty of it. Yeah. And, and anytime anybody says that it's better or faster, you got to do it because you're racing. Um, yep. But that's the part out of hand, I think. That's the, that, that's the problem. That's the problem. Yeah, yeah, and um, that's the only part that I don't really like about indoor racing uh, right now is a lot of that type of thing. 
that's why guys have gone, you know, AstroTurf and carpet because it's a little easier from that standpoint. But uh, yeah, I think if we could take it's that kind of part weird. out, go ahead. Oh, I see, it's kind of weird how like the tire prep thing. Like it seems like it happens to the same tracks over and over again. I mean, if yeah. I mean, like we go to OCR seed or something, and it's like, I mean, we don't tend to do that quite as much as we do other tracks. And I'm kind of like thinking, why? I mean, it's like the same tires, that's the same, same kind of thing. So, I mean, mm-hmm. is it actually beneficial? Is my question, I guess. Yeah, I, um, I mean, I remember being at our race this year at the Desert Classic, and you know, Mayfield had access to the much more tire heaters. He could. He could heat him up on his drill and burn it in if he wanted. And I remember him doing a run and coming back and going, none of this stuff makes a difference. I'm just going to run it normal. (laughs) (laughs) And, uh, but you have to be talented enough to be able to prove that that's not faster. And if you're not up to that speed, then you just start matching people that you think are going fast because of that. So, uh, yeah, you think that's the reason. Yeah, you you, you think that's it. So I, I think that's part of it. Yep. Yeah, because I was at like uh, nationals last year, and people were you know doing prep and tires, you know hobby action. People were prepping tires and stuff, and I was just thinking like, all this work I'm going to do to my tires, and it gave me what maybe a tenth or two a lap, right? And then I'm going to go out there, and if I crash one time, I'm going to lose four seconds. So is it worth it for me to even, you know, waste my time or should I focus on my own, my own problems first, you know? Yeah. I mean, that's, and that's, that's a logical way to look at it. And that's how I always looked at it. Um, you know, when I was doing my serious racing was just like, look, I'm using this as the final step. Like if I feel like I got everything together, then I want to make sure I have that together and then I can, um, try to meet meet at the summit but um yeah if i'm out there crashing four or five six times you know like you see some people do and they still think they got to do all this work it's like look you really need to clean up some things on your end first yeah and that's the same thing with stock racing i see all the time is you gotta have the fastest motor and the fastest battery and the fastest this and that but you go out and you crash four times so how was that fast stuff you got right yeah (laughs) i mean yeah same exact thing but logic and that's what i've been telling everybody that i've been helping recently is you gotta you gotta focus on your driving and staying clean and then then you can win some races but i mean that's that's the number one right there in my book yep that's what i always tell everybody i'm like you gotta be able to put in however long the qualifier is it's got to be clean it's got to be fast, but most importantly, clean. If you're doing that, you're going to maximize what you can do. If you're crashing, I don't care how fast you are, it's not going to work. Yep, so, I 100% agree. I so, um, so, so we'll, we'll um, go back over. You got a, a race coming up. Um, we've been talking a little bit about, which is at the Manufacturers Cup. Yep. Um, I think you've ran it a couple times in the past. Go over the that event at in Chico at their outdoor track a little and explain to everybody what that's all about. Yeah, it's a, been a really good event. Kevin puts it on, and Dane puts it on. It's a really great race. Um, Kevin layouts are always good, as you know. Um, it's a pretty cool format because the uh, expert or pro guys, we run um, heads up every race. There's no main event, so it's kind of like race style. Um, it's four four rounds. Um, each race is 14 minutes for nitro, 10 minutes for electric, and we start heads up motocross style, like on a staggered grid, kind of like three. Was it four rows of three or something? And uh, we run heads up for 14 minutes every time, and it's like so much fun. Um, and then they, I think they take the like highest finishing open driver or something to do points, and they take out which manufacturer have like the best overall performance i'm not quite sure how that works but it's something to that effect but it's a pretty cool race chico puts on a great show the track is awesome dessert's awesome it's just a fun time for sure i wish you were coming this year jason but 
Yeah, we want, you have to settle for Thomas. Um, we yeah, got. It'll be uh, good. We got a big. Um, we got a big run of events. Um, not only for me, but uh, there's some others. But so you got the manufacturers cup that you're that we're talking about. Then the the very next weekend is AMS. And then it's two weeks, then the Roar Nationals. So, yeah, wow. sure that one. so what I was trying to do is I was trying to take off Manufacturers Cup. Uh, we have an event, uh, actually the same weekend that AMS is going on. So Paul and Thomas are going to do AMS and, uh, you know, Ryan and Ryan and Spencer, uh, the guys are going to be at AMS. But um, I actually am going to Horizon for their Horizon Fest they have a uh, they have a conference before the Horizon Fest, and then they actually have the uh, Horizon Fest event, which is the same weekend. So, them being a uh, obviously a, a big customer and uh, able to put on the big time event like this fest, um, I'm looking forward to to checking it out. Uh, yeah, that's cool. And then, of course, the Roar Nationals, which is in uh, Hutto, Texas, which actually probably one of my favorite tracks to go to um, in Hutto, covered eight scale track, um, one of the best for sure. That's nice, summertime. So uh, let's give a, a little uh, schedule here of what you got coming after Manufacturers Cup. What are you going to do the rest of the year, and what races are you going to be trying to take in? Yeah, so doing the manufacturer's cup and the weekend after i'm doing just a jbrl down here at empire of our local ace kill tracks and then i'm taking i have to take a couple weeks and do some other stuff um and so i'm gonna be racing for a couple weeks probably till end of june i might i'm trying to go to the race at um, rain man's i think is end of june the old hot rod hobbies shootout or something they renamed it yeah um so, might be that so, one okay and then i'm I'm looking to do, I'm going to do the on-road uh, electric nationals here at Steve World for a stock touring car. And then um, as of right now, I'm planning to go to off-road Nats in Ohio. That's not, I guess that's not until like August, but I think July is pretty open. I might go out and do some a scale somewhere. August, I'm doing the Thrill of those Nationals and then Surf City. I think that's in September this year, if I heard right. Um, and then buy some littler events around here locally, support the local tracks a little bit, and then always go to Top Gun at SDRC in December. Might be missing something, but that sounds about right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> pretty close. I don't do a lot of on-road, so I'm going to try to, like July, I'm going to focus on get my on road stuff dialed in for nationals and then get my off road stuff going for off road nat. So I'll be kind of busy just getting some practice in and making sure I do good at those races. Um, let's, uh, while we're thinking about it, let's uh, kind of give a rundown of your sponsors um, or that are helping yeah. you. And... Yeah, everybody helps me out. A ton, and I can't thank everybody enough. Obviously, you guys at J Concepts have been totally awesome. I think this is like year five, maybe mm -hmm. year six. Um, team Associated, um, Brent and all the guys help out a ton. Um, I'm thankful for uh, Team Powers and Eric over at NorCal Hobbies for I, mean, I run all their electronics and been helping out recently with uh, managing the team and stuff. And I've been enjoying that, and he's been super big help getting me to races and making sure everything is dialed in. Um, Sandwall with the good radios and some, my uh, painter, Walden, he's got some good bodies for me now. And uh, yeah, I mean, everything's been pretty solid this year so far. Been pretty happy. And then um, I got some uh, fun questions that I found on the internet oh. okay. uh, that I wanted to <laughs> ask. Uh oh. Uh, Gotti's never even seen these. No, I haven't. Okay. Uh, I have okay. some questions here from so, fans also. Okay, well we'll get yeah. we'll do this and then we'll do this. Okay, fans. good. Um, <laughs> right, here's one. Now, who's who's these questions for? For 
for Kyle. Okay. But if, if you want to, you can answer too, Gotti. This is... All and, right. And they're going to be all over the place. They're going to be a little all over the place. Uh, this first one is like so so. Oh. Um, what would you name your boat if you had one? Name a boat? Well, yeah. I can say we named our old boat, but that kind of okay. probably ruins the question. No, it's okay. <laughs> we had a boat up at a, a lake, and it was like parked all year, and we had a cabin, and we named it Fish and Tails because we mm-hmm. go fishing like a couple times a week, so that was kind of our little thing, our little little fun thing we had up there. So that kind of ruins the if I had one because I had one, and that was, that was it. <laughs> okay, Gotti, how about you? The Flying Wasp. <laughs> Do you know what that's from, Jason? No. Caddyshack. Come on, man. Oh, I was thinking of uh, the movie with John Candy. They named the name of the boat "Suck My Wake." <laughs> oh, that's. <yeah. laughs> you remember that? Yep. Great outdoors. Yep. Okay. Next question: What will finally break the internet? Uh, Fortnite, probably. I'm gonna okay. guess. Okay. Fortnite. How about, <laughs> how about Gotti? Um, what would finally break the internet? Yeah. What will finally break the? Man, internet? I don't know. Gosh. Uh. This podcast. Yeah, this podcast. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> It'll break it. Okay. Not in a good way. Not this episode. I mean, what? this whole yeah, podcast. I, mean, I, mean, I know. Yeah, in, in, in a good way. In a good way. <laughs> What celebrity <laughs> would you rate as a perfect ten? Ooh, I I don't know. I'm not a big celebrity person. I I really don't know. Britney Spears. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Which, which fictional character would be the most boring to meet in real life? I'm thinking the. Uh... Patrick from SpongeBob. Okay. What? Boring. Yeah. Patrick would be awesome. He talk a lot, but he'd be pretty, he'd be pretty funny though. He'd be cool to hang out with. He's you know dumb and yeah, he's pretty chill. <laughs> but he'd be boring at the same time. I think. I know some people like that. What is the best and worst purchases you've ever made? That's an easy one. Tracks track slash. Slash. <laughs> I'm sure. Okay. I'm sure Jason was already thinking that one. Yeah. Yeah. What was yours, Jason? Not here. I'm asking the question. Oh, come on. <laughs> no. What, so what's the worst? What's the worst one, Kyle? Um. Worst purchase ever. Yeah. Tracks of slash. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, I mean, I spent a lot. Of, I spent a lot of money on this RC stuff. <laughs> yeah, and I wouldn't been... have bought that two hundred dollar kit. I wouldn't be yes. out tens of thousands of dollars. That's right. <laughs> That's true. That's the reality of it, right there. It is. <laughs> I don't even want to know how much money I've spent. It's been a lot. Well, my dad's spent a lot of money on me too, but yeah, you know, combined, it's it's been a lot. Okay, how about how about this? Um, what are some things that sound like compliments but are really insults? <laughs> I'm keeping uh, these questions are just for Kyle. I'm out. Can you, can you repeat the question? <laughs> what are some things that sound like compliments but are actually insults? I was thinking of something like RC when it came off the stand and someone like says something I can't think of what it is though and it's like they're being nice but they're actually saying that you suck kind of thing yeah so like I, I was just I'm just thinking of this now so you come off the driver's stand and you crash like four times and a guy's like hey nice run <laughs> yeah that's it that's it like good run good job nice try oh nice try that's a good one I've heard nice a try times. yeah I don't like nice try I don't like that one yeah, nice just out here, kind of lame. yeah just out here trying I mean I like Kyle. He's a good trier. Good trier. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I Sounds try like something I'd say. I never do, but I try. Yeah, that would be 
That's a tough one. I've actually so, heard that, I think, a couple times. <laughs> At least you tried. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, okay, I'll, I'll stop after... Uh... <laughs> he has, like, a 30-question list. <laughs> okay, I, I, got, I got a few more. Um, this one's for Gotti. Oh. What's a bo- what's a body part that you wouldn't mind losing? <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Um <laughs> We're gonna start flip flopping these questions. So Gotti has to come up and then Kyle comes. I'm glad you started with this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's why I can that's why I moved it over. <laughs> um yeah, I guess I, I wouldn't mind. You know, if I had to lose a body part, I guess it would just be an arm. I mean, I could do without. I, an arm? <laughs> yeah, what the heck? I mean, if I had to pick a body part. Huh? Not a toe? Oh, well, you're going down to like, okay. I thought you meant. Uh, all right. Uh, I mean, big deal. So I lose a toe. Who cares? I mean, but I'm talking about, let's go with the uh, arms, legs, head. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, if it had, yeah, an arm, a finger, something like that, yeah, I wouldn't care. The next one's for, for Kyle because I think he's got some experience here, and then so does his dad. So does his dad. What's your biggest screw up in the kitchen? Ooh, well, my dad, I don't think he's burned any cookies, but, <laughs> uh, in the kitchen. I uh, caught the barbecue on fire a couple times, trying to help my dad barbecue some chicken, and that wasn't very good. I fell <laughs> back as he's like the expert, and I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. You're not using the uh, barbecue guy. Okay. I uh, all right. I I melted a pot once. A metal pot? Yeah, apparently. I don't know. I I had boiling water on the stove, and I forgot about it for a few hours. And I came back, and the pot was, like, completely deformed, and it was melting. Like, it looked like it was melting, you know what I mean? But, yeah, it was really bad. You can ask <laughs> Carrie about it. She could back that story up. Yeah, it's crazy. I'm sure. I mean, I don't know. What are, what are the pots made out of, Jason? Aluminum or something? Some kind of, you know what I mean? Well, they call it pot metal, right? I don't know, but, you know. <laughs> I had the I had a cheap pot, you know. It's not like you know, not a fancy one. Like, I think it's supposed to be stainless. Goodwill. It's like, yeah. like it's like poured stainless steel molten metal. It's something cheap, though, obviously. But I mean, I left it on the stove for I think two hours. Hmm. That's impressive. Yeah, it's crazy. All right, so here's who, who are we on now? We're on uh, we're on Gotti. Um. What's the closest thing to real magic? What? Yeah, the closest thing you've seen to real magic. Uh, I don't know. Uh, watching Joel Johnson race. Okay, that's good. <laughs> Pretty good. I have a question right. for you. Where did you find the questions? Yeah. Hey, I'm not really yeah, revealing this... my source. Hey, Kyle, I might be <laughs> editing this. I might be editing this out of the show. But anyway. Hopefully I have good editing skills. I'm looking up photos <laughs> on Google of pots that have melted. And there's a perfect photo here. And I'm going to show it to you. And this is what it looked like. So I'll send it through to you, okay. Jason. What ridiculous, okay. what ridiculous thing has someone tricked you into doing or believing? This this, Ooh, this is a full okay. racing thing. You could you could act, uh, answer this on a racing level. Um, so what if someone tricked me into in the racing world? Yeah, you could just say what's something that somebody tricked you into, or they just led you to believe something, and then later you're just like, oh, this is BS. Mm, man, that's a tough one. I can't. I got. I can think of some funny stuff, but. Uh, I'm like looking at my car and I'm trying to figure out what I had ever done wrong to my car that would be funny. <laughs> that someone told me that it should have been one way. I honestly don't know. Everyone's been pretty good to me. 
It's gonna change. Okay. Now. This this one will be forgotten because it applies. <laughs> if you were if you were given a one minute ad slot during the Super Bowl, but it wouldn't sell, what would you fill it with? So basically, you know what I, you know what I mean. Like you couldn't sell a one minute spot, and you had to fill it with something. What would you fill it with? Radio impound podcast ad. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> <clears throat> That's what I was gonna say. That, was, that would be my guess. Okay, so for Kyle, what's the most useless talent that you have? <laughs> huh. Useless talent? I mean, I can juggle. That's pretty useless. All right, that's not bad. I can't answer mine on cool here. Though, but it's kind of... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I could, but uh... you could. Yeah, yeah, it's a useless talent. <laughs> Not your best talent. Oh, okay. Most... <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we'll get to these fans' questions. Uh, some listeners sent questions okay. in. Uh, this is from Tom Rockwell, and uh, at the Stock Nats, what timing and gearing did Kyle find to work best? And also, slipper cutch or lockout? Okay, so I actually went to the race with I had I built a brand new factory light car for a local race and I took it there with me and it had a lockout in it. But I ended up running my mod car with pucks in it, which had a slipper in it. So that's the first answer, I guess. Okay. Um, second, which I can grab my car and look at it, but I believe I'm not running really reading stuff like most people think. Um, the Team Powers motors, I ran a 2972 with 45 degrees of timing, I believe. Damn. Cranked. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. It was actually timed a little more for the qualifiers, but a 10-minute main, I decided I should probably turn down a little notch or two just to okay. make sure she'd finish. That's good. It didn't get hot, though, which I was super, kind of surprised. Mm. Hey, Jason, uh, this listener wants to know, uh, can J-Concepts help Kyle with a plane ticket to attend one of the J-Concepts sponsored Border Wars race? Border Wars? Yeah, what's that? Does Kyle know which one that is? The Border Wars? That's yeah. A, that, that's a series in uh, New Mexico, Texas, like Nitro Racing. <laughs> Yeah, I, I know mean, um, Tony. Uh, I think his name's Tony. I can't, I can't pronounce his last name. With an H, I think. He's a J Concepts guy over there. Maybe he knows more about it than I do. Mm-hmm. I know yeah, I mean, a lot. I, I remember the the flyer, seeing the flyer on Facebook. The, but um, yeah, I think it'd be kind of odd to for you to do a travel eight scale race. But um, I was thinking more like doing a J Concepts race. Um, yeah, we need, is the next we need to race. <laughs> well, actually, this weekend is uh, the race oh. in Tacoma, the the INS race in Tacoma. Oh, it is. Oh, man. Mm-hmm. I always forget about this one because, like, a busy time of year locally, and then I always like bypass it because the next weekend is like Manufacturers Cup, close to mm-hmm. it. Next year, remind me, okay, Jason? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. We'll give you the uh, the heads up. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but we need some more information about the border wars. All right. Well, that question was from Jimmy DePrez. Hmm. Okay. So, Jimmy. Well, are you sponsoring the race, aren't you, Jason? I think we're a sponsor, but we're not the only sponsor. It's not like our series or oh. we're one of the supporting sponsors. Okay. All right, Jimmy, uh, shoot us some info over. Yeah. Uh, Nate asks, uh, who does your who does your fancy turnbuckles? <laughs> Nate. That must be Nate Burns. Nate Burns. He yeah. does for me. Uh, yep, he does my blinging J-Concept turnbuckles. Blue and Kashima colored. They're oh. pretty dialed. <laughs> so, yep. um, so Nate offers he that as a service? Thanks, thanks Nate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he uh, – say that again? 
So you can uh, send your turnbuckles to him, to Nate, and he'll do them up for you? Yeah, he does uh, turnbuckles, screws, the, the fancy j the shock standoffs, anything titanium, ball studs, Sweet. axles, anything. All right. Yeah. Well, there you go, listeners. You can contact Nate Burns. He's right there on our um, questions for Kyle. Um, Nate Dog. Nate Dog. Justin Moon asks, uh, who has helped you in the past that has helped you get to where you are today? Uh, that'd be a lot of people. He, he he's he's one of them. But uh, my dad's been a big help, and uh, like all, like I guess all the local guys that um were there when I started have been pretty much with me. They're still with me here, you know, um, helping me out and checking in my race results. And yeah, it's just a lot of people helped me out and all my sponsors helped me out a ton every race I go to. And I'm very thankful for all that. All right. Uh, this next question is from Chris Trudeau. Uh, Chris asks, what's the biggest challenge facing racers in stock? Wow. Well, that's a pretty broad question, but. I think we kind of talked about a little bit. Um, he he also we, says, do you find the motor wars to be a factor? Um, yes and no. I think it's important to have a good motor, but I think sometimes people get a little bit um, too into it, you know, like with the little motor boxes and stuff. Like people that know that I race, like know that I've had some motors for me that I've gotten from my sponsor before, like, that have been kind of like picked through or picked the best ones. But for stock nets, I got a box of six motors, two for each car, and I took the wrapping off of them and that's what I ran. So nothing special there. And I don't, I don't think it kind of goes back to my thing where I said earlier, um, where your uh, mentally and your consistency is more important than your equipment right because like if you make up say i guess at a tenth or two a lap at the faster motor then you crash once then why have it right right Mm -hmm. jason what are you doing over there printing something out i printed something (laughs) (laughs) i'm still working over here jason's still working yeah um i'm sort of renting but not really Canadizing his turnbuckle. Well, you said you're wrenching now. Here's the oh, other that part. Makes... Here's the other part oh, of that Nate question. That. Uh, tool, your favorite tool in the pit box you can't leave home without? Um, favorite tool in the pit box? Well, you have to have a two millimeter to work on your car. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> favorite cool tool um, would definitely be the uh, little nut driver for the shock standoff or for the shock nuts. Mm-hmm. The Jake Compass one, of course. Yeah. That little thing is definitely nice when you got to put those front shocks on. Yep. And then the bottom ones, too, on the back, if you put the little stud in the arm, like everybody does nowadays. Yeah. Yep. As as simple as it is, it's very, very, very effective. Uh, Derek Stevenson wants to know, how often should one send it? <laughs> every time, every time. <laughs> you know, that's what Allison, Allison Rona weighed in on that one. She said, as often as possible. She knows what's up. That's right. Thomas Tran wants to know where, where's the awesome cookies at? Ah, yeah. Now we're getting down. They will, they will be a manufacturer's cup, Thomas. <laughs> Here we go. Maybe uh, maybe we'll send a bag home with them or something. What's that all about? Fill me in. Oh my uh, my dad, he uh, comes to track and he brings his homemade chocolate chip cookies and oh, then honestly, people everybody said they're probably the best cookies they ever had. And his nickname at the track that um, a couple guys gave him was Mister Fields, <laughs> like Mrs. Fields, you know, Mister Fields. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, so everybody. Every time I go to the race, they'll come by my pits and you got cookies, you got cookies, and it's kind of like a little fun thing, you know, in the pits. And sometimes they'll bring some some bread or something for Jason and Allison. But yeah, that's only a special for you guys too, by the way, Jason. 
What's that? Just on it every week in the current. Oh, really? Yeah. The, the brand and stuff. Yeah. Mm, yep. Okay. <laughs> so next time you come out here, you got to place your order. Okay. Maybe we can get Pops to send send some cookies to the studio. <laughs> yeah, shoot me an address. We'll go eat you some. I'd love to try that. Yeah. Hmm. I know Allison wanted some barbecue last week when she sent my order out. I don't know if you saw that, Jason. She was asking. I saw that somewhere. I was like, man, she's getting these special orders in everywhere. <laughs> well, she's helping me out, you know, get my order out. That's good. This weekend, so she's awesome. And I'm glad. I I'm, I'm, uh, appreciate uh, you saying that. Yeah. Never a complaint there, for sure. All right, Kyle. Give a give a shout out to you. I don't. Did you do your sponsors already, or did we cut through that? No, we did. We did. I think we're good. All right. I'm doing again. <laughs> no, it's okay. The more the better. Yeah. The most important ones here, anyways. Yeah. Right. Here we go. Associated J Concepts. Yep. All right. Yeah. Rip. Do you, do you rip. Stickers, Scotty. What was you that? Get con? some stickers from you. You want stickers from you? Oh, really? You you would you would uh, run yeah, them for me? Yeah, shoot, shoot me your logo because I make my own stickers, so I just print them out. Oh, that's awesome! Done, done deal. I'd really appreciate that, Kyle. That'd be yeah. awesome. Yeah, yeah. Shoot me a. Uh, I can send my email and or Jason can or I can or yeah something yeah. Well, we'll hook up on Facebook then. We'll I'll send you a message. Give you my yeah. phone. Awesome. Appreciate that. Cool. Yeah, it was yeah. great having you on the show, man. Yeah, it was fun. Thank you. All right. Big, big thanks to Kyle Layton for being on the pod. That was really awesome. Um, we wrapped it up there at the end. Uh, as soon as Kyle hung up, we had, had some issues with the audio. It's, um, up here in PA, we've been having, you know, just horrible weather. And um, during the pod, it was, um, you know, I was holding my breath because uh, my internet's just really sketchy when uh, the weather's bad and it was pouring and it was windy during the recording but uh we were able to get it in so that's good i was happy with that um but yeah towards the end here we just it was real quick and we uh jason just talked about some of the events he had coming up and so forth um you know they have the j concepts race this weekend at tacoma washington um so best of luck to all our friends out there uh i see some photos of Pete Phillips sent me a photo of him wearing the Radio Impound t-shirt at the track there, representing. That's awesome, man. I appreciate it, Pete. Uh, friend of the show, Kyle Predmore, supporter over at patreon.com slash radio impound. Uh, Kyle won himself a prize not too long ago. Uh, J Concepts hat. He's out there getting that autographed. So uh, big thanks to Kyle. And uh, Chad Eubanks, uh, bro. Chad's been supporting the show since day one, I, I think. And he's always tagging us in the posts and uh, running the logo. So that's really awesome. Uh, I appreciate that. It definitely doesn't go unnoticed, bro. Uh, if you would like to run the logo on your car also, you can go over to, uh, you know, if you get your decals from Stick It One, they have our logo there. BoomRC.net has our logo. Carpies, C-A-R-P-Y-S dot com. They have our logo. They have our T-shirt. You can order the T-shirt, the official RIP T-shirt over at Carby's. And don't forget to visit our friends, of course, jconcepts.net. Go over there. Tell your hobby shop. Stock it. Get the tires. Get the parts. Show Jason some love. Jason and Allison, show them some love over there. They're, they're out there hustling, supporting you guys at these races. Uh, they're always there for you, so... When you buy J Concepts, you know you're going to have, you know, the whole support of the team. So that's that's awesome. So jconcepts.net. Uh, go over and visit our good friend Paul Lemieux over at teamgravityrc.com. And, you know, we need to get uh, Paulie back on the show. Um, I talked to Paulie about this, so it will happen. Uh, we'll get Paulie on to get us all caught up. Um, with everything going on in the on-road 
side of things. So that'd be cool. Um, so yeah, head over to teamgravityrc.com and tell them God he sent you. All right, that is it. Episode 192 in the books. 193 is on deck. 